to Life After Brokenness, the show that reminds you that no matter what life throws at you, you have the power within to overcome it. I'm your host, Melody Moss, and I want to thank you for tuning in and spending some time with me. I bind and break every trigger from all of your senses. Every trigger word, every harmful image, cue, or hypnotic suggestion right now. I bind the power of mind control, and I command its power to be broken and of no effect. Any manipulation or witchcraft, I bind, break, and render it null and void. It has no more power over you. Any devices that have been implanted in your body to control you, whether they are chips, pins, webs, or ports, I break their power over you. No weapon formed against you will prosper, including weaponized frequencies and signals in the air. I bind any demonic activity in and around you and your loved ones. I bind any effects from alcohol or drugs and command them to be broken. I bind any programming that you've been subjected to now. I declare your mind is free from binding influences, and you are now able to think clearly for yourself. So what was that all about? Just as a song on the radio can bring back a memory of another place in time, or the smell of certain foods can remind you of home. Our senses have a way of triggering memories in our mind, both good and bad. Triggers can also be anything that reminds one of a traumatic event. For example, fireworks could trigger a combat vet. A dark stairway or a certain cologne could trigger a rape victim. A dead animal, blood, a cross, candles, even the name of Jesus, and any number of things could trigger a satanic ritual abuse victim. And there can be a number of words, cues, or images that might trigger someone subjected to mind control. Anything a person can conceive with their senses could bring back to their memory details that can overwhelm them at any time. These triggers can shut down a person and close them off from receiving ministry. I understand why the Lord spoke to me about breaking triggers first, as this allows an individual to more readily receive ministry and help. Also note that the commands that I spoke have no mention of Jesus in them, because it is very common in programming and in satanic ritual abuse to repel anything involved with that name. Therefore, I break the triggers without saying, in the name of Jesus, so that the mind can receive the commands without blocking them. After they're broken, I use his name all I want. Some of those commands are not going to apply to everyone, but no two stories or circumstances are going to be alike. So, I'm just covering all the bases. I will purpose not to be very graphic in this podcast. However, if you do feel like you're being triggered, remind yourself that this will pass and that you are safe. You may want to wrap up in a blanket, slow your breathing, focus on an item, perhaps even a piece of jewelry or something personal to you that you didn't have during the time of the trauma, and keep your mind on the present. You may want to listen to some calming music or step away for a bit if you need to before you come back and continue listening. I don't expect this to be an issue. I only do this as a precaution because of the subject matter. So without further ado, I'm going to share with you about blood and about its significance in the spirit realm. There is power in the blood. But what does that mean? Blood is perhaps the most precious commodity in both the spiritual and natural realm. It has a legal component 
and it is also a currency between realms. Blood is powerful in the spirit realm. Through blood, the spirit world is able to operate in our world. God uses this for our benefit. The enemy uses this for his own plans. Blood is used in a number of ways, and some of which we'll examine here. There is life in the blood, and there is no other substance like it that exists. Scientists have tried to recreate it, but to no avail. If one loses too much blood, they must get a suitable transfusion or they'll die. Blood is necessary for life. I can attest to that because on two separate occasions, I have had to have transfusions or I wouldn't have made it. So I really want to thank those of you who do donate blood because without that and God's healing power, I wouldn't be here. And that goes true of untold thousands or millions of people. So from the bottom of my heart, I give you a very sincere thank you. White blood cells are part of your immune system that protects your body from infection. These cells circulate through your bloodstream and tissues to respond to injury or illness by attacking any unknown organisms that enter your body. Platelets play a major role in blood clotting. They control bleeding and help heal wounds. Blood flow helps oxygenate, nourish, and cleanse the body. God the Father has no blood as we do. His life is love and light. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's James 1.17. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And that's 1 John 1, 5. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that's John eight twelve. Jesus became flesh, and he has both blood and light. He is the bridge between God and man. Blood speaks. It has a voice. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And that's Genesis 4.10. Of course, Abel wasn't the only life taken by another. He was just the first murder victim. Imagine the blood of 40 to 50 million aborted children crying out to God each year. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. And that's Deuteronomy 32, 43. And Jesus' blood still speaks. And to Jesus, the mediator, the go-between or the agent of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel which cried out for vengeance. And that's Hebrews 12, verse 24. From the Amplified Bible Classic Edition. Blood protects us and marks us as God's own people. We see this clearly demonstrated during the first Passover. The Israelites were instructed to sacrifice a lamb and apply its blood on the two doorposts and on the lintel of each house. Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed his blood to spare our lives too. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
and that's Exodus 12, 12 through 13. I'm going to talk a little bit about blood covenants. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood, and that's Hebrews 9, 18. I'll spare you all the bloody details, other than to say that when God made a covenant with Abraham, a lot of animals died that day, and it was messy. You'll find this account in Genesis 15. Through this blood covenant, God was confirming three promises he made to Abraham when he called him. The promise of heirs, of land, and of blessings. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's Genesis 12, 2 through 3. Led by Moses, Israel affirmed their covenant with God. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. And that's Exodus 24, 8. Now these covenants were only a foreshadowing of a better covenant to come. The blood of animals could never remove sin. The life of an animal is not a sufficient substitute for a human life. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. That's Hebrews 10.4. Only the blood of the sinless Son of God could take away the sins of the world once and for all. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And that's Matthew 26, 28. And of course, that's Jesus speaking those words. Anytime there is an agreement with blood, it could be considered a form of covenant, including circumcision, breaking the hymen in marriage, and other pacts such as becoming blood brothers. All the way back to Genesis, in the beginning, it appears as though all creatures were herbivores, or what we would call vegetarians today. And God lays this out for Adam and Eve. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And that's according to Genesis 1, 29-30. So during that time, There is no living creature that's supposed to be eating any other living creature. After the great flood, God changed the rule and upgraded the menu, allowing consumption of meat. He instructs Noah, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life that is, its blood, according to Genesis 9, 3, and 4. So now man can eat animals, but just not partake of the blood, because the blood is life, and God doesn't permit that. This is a very serious matter with God, with some severe consequences. This is something we find in the Bible in a number of places. For it is the life of all flesh, Its blood sustains its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is in its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. According to Leviticus 17, 14. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You may not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the earth like water, according to Deuteronomy 12, 23 and 24. Notice it is forbidden to eat the blood of any flesh. Is that just in the Old Testament? Some say yes, 
but I'm not so sure. Although Jesus' work was finished on the cross, I believe the blood still speaks in the spirit realm. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. And that's according to Acts 21.25, and it's also mentioned in Acts 15 verses 20 and 29. Life for us is in Jesus' blood. Notice that this is the only time we are encouraged to eat flesh and drink the blood together. It's a spiritual matter as well as a covenant. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any one eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. And that's John 6, verses 47 through 54. Let's switch gears a bit and talk about sacrifices to God. Have you ever considered how much love is shown in the following verse? Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And that's Genesis three twenty one. Don't see the love yet? Allow me to show you. In the previous chapter of Genesis, we see God's warning to Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's Genesis 2, verse 17. God is not a man that he should lie. And the serpent was certainly around for God's pronouncement. Don't you think that the accuser of the brethren was just waiting for Adam and his wife to kill over dead? Something surely had to die, so God himself provided the first sacrifice, a substitute to take the punishment in their place. Sacrifices to God were for the benefit of man. It was his pattern. Abraham knew that God would provide a substitute on the mountain with Isaac too. He knew God and trusted that he'd deliver on his promises. Notice, it's the blood that atones for the soul. The blood of Jesus atones for our souls today. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And that's Leviticus 17.11. One definition of atone is make amends or reparation. Christ's death fulfills God's will. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Christ's death perfects the sanctified. 
and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And this is a passage from Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 18. The takeaway here is that God allowed the sacrifices of animals for a time to protect man from certain death. But he took no pleasure in those sacrifices or offerings. However, The life of an animal is not a sufficient substitute for a human life. So Jesus was sent to die in our place. His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Not only that, he showed us how to live in the Spirit as a man in this world. Because of what he suffered at the whipping post, he provided our healing. And his blood atones for our soul. He paid the price for our spirit soul, and body, for our salvation, healing, and the soothing of our soul once and for all. I'm going to switch gears again and talk about sacrifices to demons. In the Bible, there are blood sacrifices to the one true God and also to false gods or idols, and God isn't too happy about that. When blood is shed as ritual sacrifices to idols, demons, or Satan, authority is given to them. Humans partner with evil, and demonic spirits are given permission and legal access through that blood. The more innocent the blood, the more powerful it is. That's why the higher the world's abortion rate, the more evil the world seems. Young children and animals are used too. I want to interject here that abortion isn't only a sin women can commit. If anyone has performed an abortion, paid for an abortion, had an abortion, or persuaded someone to get one, generally speaking, they all have blood on their hands. Thank God Jesus paid the price for that too. There are satanic holidays throughout the year, large meetings, smaller meetings and private meetings held in secret, most of which involve blood with animal or human sacrifices, cannibalism, murder, torture, and bloodletting. The kingdom of darkness is bloodthirsty and power-hungry. The enemy likes to flaunt blood, even making commodities of it, like cosmetics, red shoes, spirit cooking, and drugs like adrenochrome. Ultimately, blood is a currency in the spirit realm. Blood is given as an exchange for authority. This is why some entertainers speak of arranging blood sacrifices to get fame and fortune, and politicians and the elite for more power and influence. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works, and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people. And that's Psalm 106, verses 36 through 40. Okay, I'm going to talk about witchcraft for a moment. Witchcraft, in a nutshell, is when one tries to harm or manipulate someone else using the spirit realm for their own purposes. Whether you call it black, 
white, or polka dot, or you spell it M-A-G-I-C or M-A-G-I-C-K, it's still sin. Also he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the sons of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And that Second Chronicles 33, 6. Often blood is used in magic and sometimes even ingested. For example, menstrual blood can be hidden and served in food to an unsuspecting male so he won't stray from the donor that hid it in his spaghetti sauce. By ingesting blood, it seems there is a mingling of life forces, human or animal, and I believe that's why God forbids it. It's for our protection. There may be other ways one may have knowingly or unknowingly been polluted or sinned with blood issues. You may have been an innocent victim. Now, some may think that this is over the top, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. So here are some things you may want to consider and pray over. What if consuming blood, like eating too rare of a steak, or eating an egg with a drop of blood, or drinking milk from a sore udder that allowed traces of blood to be in the carton that was consumed, what if that sort of thing was seen as a sin to God? Of course, there are things that we can be certain are sin, like partaking of adrenochrome, ritual blood drinking, cannibalism, and the like. No matter what the issue, the blood of Jesus trumps any of this and cleanses us of all sin. To end this podcast, I think it might be nice to do something different. Let's apply the blood of Jesus to wash away all unrighteousness, any witchcraft, and to cleanse your blood which is your life force. I'd suggest you gather the elements of communion to do this, including some kind of unleavened bread or cracker and some wine or grape juice or some substitute. Before taking the Lord's Supper, it is crucial that we examine ourselves to find if there's anything we might need to repent of, which simply means to turn away from and ask God's forgiveness for anything that you might need to make right with Him. Anything that comes to your mind. I want to share with you a scripture in 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And by that it means basically die before their time. So... I just want to say that this is something that we should do before any time we take the Lord's Supper, is to examine ourselves and see if there's anything that we need to make right with God before doing so. So I want to kind of walk you through this, and if you're not ready to take communion right now, you may want to come back and partake with me later. But um, here's like a sample prayer, okay? Lord, I want anything that hinders me from having a closer relationship with you out of my life. I am sorry for whatever you want to say. And I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. I also ask for your help in living a holy life. And you just want to kind of sit there a minute and pray until your conscience is clear. And when you're ready, take the bread and pray. Lord, on the night you were betrayed, you took bread, and when you had given thanks, you broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. So I thank you, Lord, for your body, and in it is everything I need for my sustenance, health, and provision. And I take this now in remembrance of you. Now in the same manner, you also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood washing me clean of all sin, pollution, and witchcraft. I now take your blood in remembrance of you. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and for everything you died to give me. I thank you that your blood cleanses me and my blood of all sin, and I am free. Your life force now flows through my body and gives me access to the Father. I thank you that I am now in right standing with the government of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would like to thank you for listening to this broadcast today. I hope that this blessed you, and if so, I pray that you'll consider sharing this with someone else that might benefit from it. Please follow my show, Life After Brokenness, on this platform. If you like the types of things that I teach, you may want to check out my books on Amazon.com, and I'll leave a link below in the description. You may also want to visit my site, unforgettablelove.net. And until next time, don't just survive, but thrive. Be blessed. I love you. And goodbye. Mm -hmm.